Right, this is the third and final sub-lecture of the Direct Marketing Lecture Module. So we're going to finish off on the components of direct marketing, so looking specifically at the databases and mailing lists, um, and then that final fulfillment component of direct marketing. And then for those of you that are in my class, we will do a student engagement activity, trying to bring it all together and apply direct marketing to our client for this semester. So the fourth component of direct marketing is the importance of databases or to consider the databases that you need. So time and time again, we talk about how important databases are for direct marketing because you want to selectively target only those people that are prospects rather than suspects. And so therefore, successful direct marketing is reliant upon good databases. The old saying, garbage in equals garbage out, uh, applies to direct marketing probably more so than any other marketing promotional element. Um, databases are an asset and it allows the marketer to obviously identify and contact the best prospects. It allows you to vary up your message or customize it and segment it in a way that is more relevant to specific segments within your database. Uh, whether it be, you know, culturally or language or gender or lifestyle, whatever it may be, the more information you have, the more relevant you can customize those messages and vary up the messaging. It can allow you to foster long term relationship with customers. So insurance companies, uh, banking and other companies within the finance sector are renowned for um, using the databases to obviously figure out when a person is um, in that time of their life where they need to be considering other forms of products or services that are provided. So, you know, if we think about um, ASB, they start off with the school program where they're teaching financial literacy. Um, then the kids will open an account, hopefully with them. Uh, once you open an account with them, you're obviously on their database, right? Uh, and then they might become a tertiary student at some point, which then opens them up to be receptive to a tertiary account. Then pretty soon they will need a checking account when they get a career. Then it'll be a mortgage. Uh, within the mortgage, you have to have insurance. And so they make insurance products available. Um, and then there might be, you know, vehicle insurance slightly before that. Uh, and then there's KiwiSaver planning for retirement, et cetera, right? So over the entire lifetime of the customer, um, some businesses will be able to make products and services um, applicable to those customers and therefore extract value for them from the entire uh, lifetime. And so that is really only possible with a database um, because, you know, people that work for the company will turn over, right? They'll quit, they'll go to another job. And so that data is lost, um, that personal relationship is lost, uh, but you can try and hang on to it as much as possible uh, as a company by having that information built into a database, which then just eases the uh, path for other employees to build a rapport uh, and establish a relationship with these um, lifetime customers. Um, it enhances advertising productivity uh, because with better data, you can make the messages more relevant, uh, more impactful. Uh, you can make the timing so that it reaches those people only when they're in the position to buy your product or service. Uh, and so therefore you're getting better return on investment. Uh, and finally, you can calculate that lifetime value of the customers and prospects. Um, so you probably already heard of this idea that retention is more um, effective than um, attracting a new customer, right? So if you can, so the cost of attracting a new customer can be quite high because they are unaware of your product. So you have to raise awareness first, then you have to get attention, then you have to make sure they remember you. Once a person knows about your uh, brand or is an actual customer of your brand, then it becomes much easier to extract more value from them because you don't have to spend all this money on the initial um, foundation building. Right? They already are aware of your brand. They already have experience with your brand. They already know how to purchase your brand. They already know how to use your brand. Um, there's all this inbuilt knowledge already. Uh, and so if you, if you have people like that, um, that are already using your brand, um, then it makes sense to try and get them onto a database of some sort because these are your most valuable customers because these are the customers that you can get the most money out of without spending as much money going in. Um, 
And so you can calculate the lifetime value of customers and prospects on a database, provided you have very good information uh, about them on your database. Here's a picture looking at the importance of um, data in direct marketing. So basically it's saying that 60% uh, of the consideration uh, should be about targeting. And how do you target? Well, database is the best way of targeting, right? Uh, and then so if 60% of the effort should be about targeting the right people. So this is who are you communicating with? Um, and then what you're saying to them uh, consists of that 30% of the proposition. So what are you proposing to them? Uh, and then finally, the actual execution, uh, the way the messaging looks uh, and how it gets to them. That's the last 10%. So I guess the point of this figure here is to draw attention to the importance of the very beginning stages first. Um, so getting the data right, uh, because if you don't know who you're communicating with, then everything else falls apart, because that means what you say is no longer relevant. And it doesn't matter how nice and glossy uh, the material is when it gets to them, if they're not in the market or if they don't care, uh, or if they're not the right person for your brand, then all of that effort and money is wasted. So you want to get things right from the very beginning, and that is often with um, your database in terms of getting the right target. So in terms of databases, mailing list is another term for it. So this is you know from traditional direct marketing where everything was sent out via mail. So you needed a list. Now mailing list exists, you know, as an email mailing list, uh, or um, more generally as a form of um, data on your database. So successful direct marketing depends greatly on high quality mailing lists. So up to date, relevant information, accurate information about people and rich information, sophisticated information about what they prefer, the previous products that they've used, the services that they've used, you know, when they are in the market for a new product, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and there are two ways of developing this. So the first one we're going to look at on this slide is the internal or sometimes called the house list. So this is your present or prospective customers that you've managed to create by yourself. So they're the most relevant customer because this is information that you know, you've gone and collected yourself. How do you develop these house lists? Well, this is where direct marketing links really well with sales promotions. So things like other promotions, whether it be a promo code or a coupon or entries into a competition. Um, that's, way of, that's one way of getting information from people that already find your product, brand, or service relevant. Uh, warranty cards is another really good example, uh, similar to data that you get from people registering on some sort of loyalty program with your business. So electronics is classic for this. So you know when you buy a printer, for instance, it'll tell you to you know activate the warranty. Now to do that, you're going to have to provide some sort of information. So bingo, you're straight into their database, right? Um, when I bought a Weber barbecue, same thing. I needed to, ex you know, if you enter, activate the warranty, uh, you have to give them information. Uh, then they send you information about their other products and also additional information about how to make how to make the best use out of their barbecue. Um, and finally, telemarketing efforts. So this is just you know cold calling out or subcontracting to a company that might be calling out in order to get information. Uh, about people that might find your product interesting, right? So this is a house list where you've developed the information yourself. And so you own that. And so it's a very valuable type of information um, because, you know, you've A, invested a lot of effort and resource in getting it, but B, you've asked the questions that are relevant to your business. The second type of uh, mailing list is an external or public list. So these are lists that you pub buy from other sort of um, companies, right? You purchase it from companies that um, maybe have uh, their business model is um, formed around um, compiling mailing lists and selling it on, right? Um, so market research companies do this. You can buy, you know, lists of people or access to people um, through, you know, their channels. Um, there are other ways of doing it though. So you could look to collaborate with another business that isn't a competitor, but sells similar products. Um, the classic example I use uh, might be, for instance, if you're selling bicycles uh, to pair up with a helmet company, a bike helmet company, right? Or if you're selling, um, you know, surfboards, uh, you pair up with another sporting outdoor goods uh, company and you try and sort of collate your um, data together that way. Uh, this is obviously a lot trickier though today with the Privacy Act and people's, um, I guess, the the conditions by which they share data with you is that you don't 
pass it on sometimes. Uh, and so these lists are, you know, obviously uh, trickier to get to, and sometimes the information you get may not be up to date. Uh, sometimes the people on those lists aren't exactly relevant to your product or service, uh, and sometimes you can really irritate people because they're like, how did you get my information, right? And so then that's starting off on the wrong foot already. Um, so a compiled list is when companies, you know, with access to masses of consumer data, so if you think about your countdown card uh, or your flybys card, um, essentially that is their business model, right? Is to offer awards out in order to get people to sign up to those cards, but the data they get from people signing up is worth far more than the promotions that they give away. And then they're able to then sell that data to other companies uh, that want access to particular types of people that buy particular types of products already. Um, and sometimes you can match that data with other data such as psychographic information from companies that do um, geodemographics, for instance, Experian, uh, and they have a product called Mosaic, uh, which I've consulted on that looks at, you know, breaking up any country's population into specific type of lifestyle groups. You know, they have, you know, the older, wealthier rural people, the older, wealthier uh, suburban people, the executives, the young professionals, the uni students, the uh, vocational uh, students, the tradies, all, you know, the entire society broken up into these groups. You can buy that information, uh, which may have the types of suburbs they live in, and then you match that with other information uh, and you compile it with, um, you know, information you get from a loyalty program that you've purchased from flybys, for example, and then all of a sudden you are able to um, establish a picture of the types of people that live in particular areas that may be relevant to your uh, particular product, brand or service. Um, so the problem, as I say, with these externalists is that because you haven't created it yourself, um, you're getting essentially secondary data um, and a close approximation of people that we think are interested in your brand, but there's no guarantee they are interested because it's not a primary uh, internal list uh, as we explained on the previous slide. In terms of data mining, once you have data, uh, you can do some really cool stuff with it. The example I'm gonna talk about here is EasyBuy, which is an online and physical retailer. They sell you know, mainly fashion products, but also a lot of household goods. They have a system uh, in place uh, that is you know, similar to what you read about in the textbook. So this is based on RFM, or recency, frequency, and the monetary value of each purchase. And the way that one very simple way they use their data um, to, to try and maximize uh, value extraction is that they have um, a five grade system within their database, right? Um, and it basically groups people based on the recency, frequency, and monetary value of their purchase, right? And so for example, within that data, it can um, identify uh, people and group them uh, in terms of when they're most at risk of switching to another online retailer. Sometimes it's at the five month mark, sometimes it's at the seventh month mark, and sometimes it's at the 11th month mark. So if you know that very simple piece of information already, you can already see how that might link in with a, another promotional element such as sales promotions. If I have a group of people on my database that I know are gonna switch to another retailer like H&M uh, at the fifth month, then I want to make sure I send them a voucher or discount or some sort of communication at the five or four and a half month stage, right? Just to remind them that we're still here, we value their customer, and we have an offer for them. And then I do the same thing at the customers that are at risk of switching on the seventh month mark. And then once again, I target those that are at risk of switching at the 11, year, uh, 11 month mark uh, separately, right? There's no point in providing or communicating with an 11th month switcher at the five month mark because they're just going to ignore my communication anyway and that's a wasted exposure. So I'm gonna get the timing right, right? Um, so that's the recency aspect. Uh, I wanna get the frequency right because I have to obviously contact the five month switchers um, every five months, so that's twice a year, right? Whereas I only need to contact the 11th month switchers and the seven month switchers once a year. Right, um, and the other thing is monetary value. That's another way they use um, data. Uh, so Easy Buy have they can sort the data in another way that shows people that only buy products from them when it's reduced, that only buy products with them when it's at the clearance, um, or 
only buy products, uh, well, will buy products at the full margin, so not discounted. So once again, having that very simple piece of information will uh, is you know extremely useful because as a company now, I know that I don't want to send sales promotions or discounts to a full margin customer. Right, because if I do, I'm just cutting into my profit margin because these are the people that the data shows is, are willing to buy at full margin. I want to save my discounts, my sales promotions for people that are only categorized as a, people that buy when a product is reduced. Because I know if I don't provide those people with a discount, uh, they might not buy with me and even worse, they might switch to another customer company that is providing a discount, right, reducing their their um, the cost of their offerings. So I want to target my vouchers that way. Uh, and finally, the clearance people. Uh, so these are people that buy products only when they're ready to just basically be cut and gone. Uh, very low profit margin here. Um, and so I want to you know basically make sure that when I have products that are end of season, end of line, you know weird sizes, uh, no one's really going to buy them anymore, I'm ready to basically dump the stuff, then I will make sure those people, the clearance customers, are aware of the clearance items that I have on sale. Uh, and so this is just a very quick uh, you know, example of how data analytics works um, when you have good data. Right, the final component of direct marketing is fulfillment. So it's a final but very crucial part of direct marketing. So if we go back to the philosophy of direct marketing, it is to um, you know, engage the audience member and to elicit a response. So if you're eliciting a response, then you have to be prepared to fulfill whatever that response is going to be. And typically, if we think about placing an order, that means you need to be able to, you know, obviously account for the response coming in, so record it in some way. You have to provide a point of communication for them to, you know, be able to respond. Um, then you need to be able to store the marketing materials because you're not sending it all out at once, right? You're saving some of the stuff because you're only targeting people at certain times of the year uh, according to your data. Right. Um, then there's the picking, packaging and dispatching aspect of it. So because a lot of direct marketing uh, revolves around online retail, you know, it's not just all online. Right? There's the online delivery and servicing of it. But then there's the physical part of where do you keep the stuff? Uh, how do you send that stuff to that person's house? All that sort of physical element, uh, which is very different from the digital element of, you know, sending them an email, getting them to click on the link and place an order via the credit card online. That's all easy and smooth digitally, but then you have to make sure that the you know teddy bear that they've ordered actually gets there undamaged and on time, right? And so it's a very different beast when we look at the fulfillment of direct marketing, particularly when we compare it with you know the digital components versus the physical components. Um, so so there's a pick, the picking, the packaging, the dispatching. I've got an, uh, an image on the right here of a um, of NPC, which is a company that uh, specializes in direct marketing fulfillment. Um, then there are aspects of invoicing. Then there's the analyzing and reporting because you want to keep your database up to date. Uh, and then there's little mundane things like filing, filling of envelopes and postage, right? So all these things. And so if you're thinking about fulfillment, um, one obvious question is, you know, can, can we do this ourselves um, as a business, as, particularly as a small to medium business? So in terms of fulfillment, there's in-house fulfillment, so this gives you greater control. You care a lot more because you're actually fulfilling the order uh, according to your own brand. So you know you want to make sure that the quality and the response is really high class. But on the other hand, the fulfilling aspect might be very disruptive and demanding on your organization, particularly if you're a small and medium enterprise. So I've got an example here I'll show later on for those in class where you know if you're a knife manufacturer, then you're very good at designing and making knives. That does not mean you're very good at storing knives, packaging knives, sending knives, um, you know, receiving responses to purchase your knives, uh, keeping a track tab of all the people that have bought your knives, contacting those people on their birthday. All that stuff has nothing to do with knife design, right? And so this is where if you try to do it in-house, you might find yourself spending more time and effort on stuff you're not good at. And that's where uh, fulfillment agencies come into into the picture uh, or dar direct marketing fulfillment agencies and what they do is they, they handle that part of it for you. You focus on making the best knives possible whereas they will focus on recording data, 
managing the invoicing, sending the knives out, liaising with courier companies, uh, receiving complaints initially, um, adding more information to the database. They'll do all that stuff so that you can, as the manufacturer, you can focus on manufacturing. Uh, and so that's an outside fulfillment supplier. And they basically handle the logistics of direct marketing. So, you know, whether you're tossing up between keeping it in-house or sending it out, uh, outsourcing, uh, three things come to mind. You have to think about the convenience uh, or the inconvenience of fulfilling the direct marketing campaign. Uh, you have to think about the cost. Uh, so obviously, if you outsource it, that will cost you money. But then there's also other costs like time costs and you know cognitive effort of having to worry about that side of things. And finally, the capacity of your business to actually handle fulfillment. So those three C's, convenience, cost, capacity, you have to weigh that up if you're a small to medium business and think about, can we do these things ourselves or do we need to, have we gotten to a stage now where it's so big that we should be outsourcing the fulfillment of our direct marketing campaign? So now for those of you that are in class, we're gonna do a student engagement activity, looking at all the components of direct marketing and applying it to the um, benefit of the client company we have this semester. So in summary, direct marketing, it's not just junk mail, it's an approach, a philosophy to marketing communications. There's you know, various media that you can use. Um, as long as it can generate a direct response or elicit and receive a response, then you can use just about any media you can think of. Um, successful direct marketing is highly reliant on good data, good information. And fulfillment, which is the last component of direct marketing, is one of the most crucial aspects of it, um, but it's also very different to the creation of the direct marketing campaign, and once again, very different to the creation of the product and service in the first place. And so given that, sometimes companies will consider outsourcing the fulfillment component of direct marketing.